So growing up, I had a uh, check. There we go. Thank you. We have an incredible tech and AV team. Sometimes I don't turn my stuff on, and uh, so they're amazing, so I'm thankful for them. Uh, growing up, I had a good friend whose brother had a nightscaping business. Now, at the time, I had no idea what nightscaping was, but uh, he would put floodlights not in trees but below trees because he wanted to let people see the beauty of the tree at night. So he'd put these big floodlights kind of down at the base of the tree, uh, and he'd do this at buildings and other things like that, and it just illuminated the building, it illuminated the landscape in just an incredible way. And the point wasn't that we would see, obviously, the point wasn't that we would see the floodlight. The point would be that we would see what it was illuminating, right? And the Holy Spirit's ministry to you and me is kind of like that floodlight. It's to illuminate who God is in us and through us. Well, we've been in the book of Acts um, for numerous weeks, we've taken some breaks, and, and um, normally I would just keep going through the book of Acts. So we were in Acts 13 last week, and I had anticipated, uh, and kind of how uh, just this plays out for me, I plan uh, months in advance, and, and uh, then when, and I have a schedule, and, and various people have that schedule, and, and then Monday morning rolls around, and I usually have an idea of where I'm going and so I was anticipating just continuing to go through Acts and through chapter 14. And as I was praying through that on Monday morning, uh, I just really sensed that the Spirit said, hey, why don't you talk about me this week? And I was like, okay. <laughs> and, um, and certainly, when we, as we have been looking through the book of Acts, I mean, we have seen the Holy Spirit's work in unique ways. And so this morning, in, instead of kind of preaching, I, I want to do some more, more teaching and kind of systematically talk to you about who the Holy Spirit is. Because we're going to continue to see Him in the book of Acts. We're going to continue to see Him uh, all the time, and I want us to experience Him. And I feel like sometimes the Holy Spirit gets, He, he, he gets less than... You know, we don't always talk about the Holy Spirit because we may not understand and know that third person of the Trinity like maybe we do the Father and the Son. And so this morning, I, I just I, we're going to go back to Acts a bit. Um, in fact, I'm going to get you caught up on Acts. If you haven't been here over the last uh, uh, few weeks, uh, I'll get you caught up on the first uh, 13 chapters in about two minutes. And then, uh, uh, then I also want us to talk just... There's about uh, 25 different places I'm going to show you in Scripture this morning. Um, and I've got like eight points. And so, listen, cowboy season isn't for like another month, okay? So I'm just kidding. This will be right around 20 minutes or so-ish, the first point. And so, if you haven't been here over the last, uh, you know, few months and uh, I, I want to make sure that you feel caught up to kind of where we are in the book of Acts and kind of how it all got started. And um, uh, just, well, Jesus died on the cross. He died on the cross, as we talked about the community. He died on the cross to be the, the one who took the penalty of sin from you and me. He raised himself again three days later to just authenticate the promise that he had already made. And when he raised himself again, then he went on tour, and he began to share with other people about his mission, about his cause, and say, listen, I fulfilled the promise that I made to you. Well, he shows up in Acts chapter 1. We see where he shows up with the apostles, and he shares with them, I am going to send my Holy Spirit. Now, this is so incredible. You know, even as I've been studying this, I'm thinking, I didn't get it at Acts chapter 1 like I think we should get it. I know that the apostles didn't get it at this point, but I think there was some excitement there. And so he says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and he's going to come upon you, and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, in the uttermost parts of the world, and go back to Jerusalem and pray. And so the apostles ran back down the hill. They went in, uh, then back up the hill into Jerusalem, and they started praying expectantly for the Holy Spirit to come. Well, sure enough, the Holy Spirit came. It fell. It fell at this feast called Pentecost. Pentecost was this... Uh, 
feast that the Jews had, and it was this giant celebration, and people, Jews from all over the world that spoke different languages came to this. Well, the Holy Spirit fell during Pentecost, and one of the anointings that took place there is that they were all able to speak different languages in order to share the gospel. It was beautiful. And then Peter started preaching, and 3,000 people came to know Jesus. After 3,000 people came to know Jesus, uh, then he, he uh, saw this uh, crippled man who had not been able to walk for 40 years. He was born that way. He walks up to him, and he heals him. This guy just jumps up. He preaches another th- sermon. 2,000 people come to know Jesus. And then the Sanhedrin, which is kind of like the Jewish police at the time, th- th- they were not happy about what Peter and John were doing. So they brought Peter and John into the Sanhedrin and said, you know, what's going on? You guys are just common, ignorant guys. And, but it was interesting what the Sanhedrin said. They said, but we can tell that you've been with Jesus. And anybody who's been with Jesus is uncommon, right? And so, uh, anyways, they still put him in jail. The church prayed then they were released the church celebrated and then the church continued to pray and ask for boldness rather than relief from the situation well then we see that uh there's in acts chapter 5 this uh couple named ananias and sapphira and ananias and sapphira uh they spiritually deceived the holy spirit and lied about their gifts to the church god strikes them down in the next week contributions Skyrocket. skyrocket that's right and so but despite, despite the, the conflict inside and outside the church, uh, the apostles continue to preach Jesus and the gospel, and more people are saved. Well, then we have Acts chapter 6, and in Acts, Acts chapter 6, we had prejudice and discrimination between the, the Greek believers and the Jewish believers, and so uh, the leadership goes, Man, we're not going to have that. So they appointed men of godly character and integrity, what they ended up calling deacons, and those men were to handle those type of issues and make sure that there wasn't any murmuring in the church, because God hates murmuring in the church and bitterness and those type of things. And then we see at the end of chapter 6, and then in chapter 7, there's this guy named Stephen. And Stephen, man, wouldn't you love to be known as, uh, as a guy like Stephen, where it says that he was full of the Holy Spirit and of power. Well, poor Stephen ended up being stoned to death. This guy named Saul, who later is uh, named Paul, is sitting there watching this whole thing. But because Stephen died well... The gospel continued to be preached, and it was a launching place from there where it went to other places all over the world. Well, and then Acts chapter 8, Philip uh, begins to preach in Samaria, and uh, revival breaks out. Then this occult leader tries to purchase the Holy Spirit. Peter's like, mm, no, nope, you can't do that. Then God transports Philip in the Egyptian eunuch, uh, who this Egyptian eunuch is traveling, reading scripture, but he can't understand it. But the Holy Spirit knows about this, so he, he takes Philip. He puts Philip right in front of him. And we see this picture of a willing witness and a uh, seeking soul, and a divine encounter takes place. Well, then we have chapter 9, and Saul, that guy that was uh, watching uh, Stephen's death, he is on this road to what's called Emmaus. And uh, the Holy Spirit falls and Jesus is there and he meets Jesus on the road uh, to Emmaus and he is never the same and then at the end of chapter 9 uh, we, we see scripture encourages the church to walk in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit and that is where God's power then is released and then we have Acts chapter 10 Peter is still found to be prejudiced and he, he still thinks this is just about a Jewish ordeal, but Jesus had said, this isn't just for Jews, this is for everybody. So Peter's still being found prejudiced. God comes to him in a vision. Well, God also comes to a guy named Cornelius in a vision and says, hey, Cornelius, why don't you go uh, visit Peter? And Peter, go visit uh, Cornelius. And they get together, and God reminds Peter that the gospel is for everybody, and all the dietary restrictions are also released, and bacon is now uh, part of the deal for, for everybody. <laughs> then King Herod uh, kills James, brother John. Peter was in prison, uh, but an angel woke him up and got him back to Mary's house where Rhoda opened the door. This is such a funny, you ought to go see this in, in chapter 11. Rhoda opens the door, sees Peter. She's so excited, then she shuts the door back in Peter's face because she's like, hey, Peter's at the door. But, and, but then Herod presents himself as a god, but an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms. And then last week, you got all that? So easy. And last week, we, we see the Holy Spirit informing the church to go. And so let me read that for you, just four verses And then I'm going to take you to another passage too. So Acts chapter 13, and if you want to put your finger on John chapter 14, ah, incredible passage. So Acts 13, now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now we know uh, Saul is, is Paul now. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, 
Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. So again, in just about every chapter, we see the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, engaged in the life of the church. And we have this incredible picture here that, 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 that he is sending people out on God's mission, right? That he's the one informing them. Now, go to John chapter 14, and we're just going to look at about uh, five or six verses there. John chapter 14, we're going to look at verses 16 through 20 and 25 through 27. And it will also be on the screen. And this is Jesus talking. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. So he's talking about the Holy Spirit. We're going to come back to that. We're going to explain the whole thing. You're going to have an entire systematic theology on the Holy Spirit this morning in right around 20 to 60 minutes. <laughs> and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I got to pause. Like, I need you to get this for a second. So in John chapter 1, it says that Jesus comes and he dwells with us. The word, the Greek word is minnow. Say minnow. minnow. Now, it's not minnow like the fish. It's minnow like M-E-N-O. Minnow. Say minnow. minnow. It means he is localized there. And we have this, what we call the incarnation of Christ. It means that Jesus has come and he is with us, right? So the, the Hebrew name, Emmanuel, God is with us. So Jesus dwelt on the earth for 33 and a third years. He was with us. That same word is right here in John chapter 14, the word minnow. And it says that Jesus says that he is leaving and he is giving us the Holy Spirit who will dwell, who will minnow, who will localize himself with us and in us. I mean, is that not a wow? Amen. Yeah, amen. <laughs> I mean, this isn't just that, that, that he came to earth, and that is, that's incredible that Jesus came to earth, but then he leaves his deity, the third person of the Trinity, in the same language, in the same usage. And he says, I am going to localize him, not just on the earth, but I'm going to localize him in you as a child of God. God lives in you. In the form of the Holy Spirit. Like, check that out, folks. <laughs> Golly, that's so good. I may come back to that. Verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while in the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. Verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be trouble, troubled, neither let them be afraid. Wow. I think that's incredible. So, so who is this third person of the Trinity? And um, so, so we have all these different names that we see in Scripture. We see helper here. Some of your translations say comforter. Some of your translations say counselor. Some of them say advocate. Um, and... and, and just to know, whenever you see different translations, they're not disagreeing necessarily. Uh, these translations, the, the, the English word is just, uh, or the Greek word is just so rich that English just really doesn't have a way to sum it up all in one word. And so you see these different translations that are kind of trying to feel out 
the description of what they mean. You know, for instance, like if we think of a comforter, we, we think of somebody who's alongside, who's kind of hand-holding, or a counselor, maybe somebody who's listening to us, or a helper. You may think of like an assistant or, or administrator. Uh, what I love, though, is this idea of advocate. In fact, I think that's probably the best translation for this particular word, is the word advocate. And, and, and I want you to think of kind of an attorney when, when we're talking about an advocate, somebody who represents you in court. And, and here's, here's why. So the Greek word is the word paraclete. Say paraclete. paraclete. So paraclete. And it's two words squished together, kaleo and para. So kaleo uh, means that you're calling or you're directing somebody. Okay? So you're calling or you're directing somebody. Para means you're walking alongside somebody. So like a paralegal, right? Or a paramedic. You're alongside. You're with somebody. So uh, interesting combination of terms. You're directing, telling somebody, and walking alongside. I mean, there's you know, a little bit of tension between those two ideas. But again, that's, that's why I think this idea of advocate is a great one. Um, because an advocate is somebody who speaks forcefully into you, for you. It's not, uh, it's not passive, it's active. It's somebody that's pointing you toward the truth uh, or toward a goal. You know, you, you aren't just talking or even asking, you're pressing toward someone or something. And yet, the other side of that, to come alongside means to be sympathetic or empathetic, to be in a relationship, to stand in one's shoes. So I want you to think about the Holy Spirit in, in a sense as kind of that uh, defense attorney who is speaking for you and is also sympathetically on your side. He, he, he's not there merely to comfort you, but to guide you. In, in fact, your defense lawyer um, may have some hard and challenging things to, to say to you, but we can know that it's always for our good or for the cause, right? And he doesn't merely speak to you, but he also speaks to the powers that be for you. And here's what you're going to see this morning, is that the Holy Spirit speaks to you and for you. He speaks to you and for you. So, point number one. All right, you ready? We're going to go quick. Not as quick as the, the Acts remix, but uh, if, you want, if you want these notes, you just email me, okay? First thing is this. The Holy Spirit is not just a force, but a person. Important to know. I think we get that mixed up a lot. He's not just a force. He is a person. Jesus speaks of the Spirit in certain ways that would have been extraordinary to the apostles. And we see even the apostles are, are, are kind of getting their hands around this as, as Acts is unfolding. But the first thing he says about the Spirit is that he is a person. So in Greek, the nouns are assigned a gender, okay? So there's male, female, and neuter. So, so the, the word spirit is neuter, but it's always used by Jesus as masculine, as a person, as a he. So it's a person there. You know, Jesus is saying that after he leaves, after he dies, the Father will send a person in his place. We also see Jesus says that he will be leaving and this person will be coming. He says in John 16, 7, unless I go away, the advocate will not come, but if I go, I will send him to you. John 14, 18, and in another sense, he says, I will come to you. The advocate says that. It, and so it's through this person that we will be able to, to, to see Jesus even though the world can't. You know, in one sense, he'll be gone, but in another sense, his presence will remain, and it's mediated by the person of the Holy Spirit that the Father has sent. So, so again, first thing is this, the, the Holy Spirit is not a force. Now, it has force. I mean, <laughs> it has incredible power, but it is a person. Second thing is this, is the Holy Spirit regenerates the redeemed. 
The Holy Spirit regenerates the redeemed. So we've talked about this multiple times already this morning. I mean, this is the essence of the gospel, that once we realize Jesus' redemptive work in us through the cross and, and we make him king, there's a regeneration that takes place. So what Jesus does on the cross is he pays for that sin. His blood becomes the righteousness necessary for us to be known and seen by a holy, just God. And so Jesus puts it, it's called imputes, he puts his righteousness in us. But what also happens is that the Holy Spirit immediately falls and comes in us and we are regenerated so uh, there's a conversation in john chapter 3 that jesus is having with this guy named nicodemus and nicodemus is is going what's this idea of being born again or being reborn and nicodemus says you know i'm an old dude how am i reborn again and jesus looks at him and says you know apart from water in the spirit you cannot be born again So this idea of of the regenerative work of the Holy Spirit happens immediately upon the soul of the one who makes Jesus king. And when I say immediately, I'm not saying that it like happens quickly. I'm not saying that it's like a dose of medicine and there's a process and eventually takes root and it invades your body. I'm talking it happens without any type of mediation or intervention. It happens instantly that the Holy Spirit invades your life. I like that we're a little more talkative today. That's good. The third thing is this. The Holy Spirit is, the, is for the work of God and the gospel of Jesus. It's for the work of God and the gospel of Jesus. So the Holy Spirit hasn't just come to meet our personal needs, and it certainly hasn't come to meet our personal needs as maybe we desire or understand by our own Motives. In fact, James 4.3 kind of talks about this uh, when he's talking about prayer. He says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. <laughs> so, I mean, one of the questions that we need to ask is, you know, why do we desire the Holy Spirit's activity in our life? I mean, again, the Holy Spirit is for the work of God and the gospel of Jesus, but why do we desire the Holy Spirit's activity in our life? I mean, we want to experience more power, right? We want to experience more of the Holy Spirit, but is it for our benefit, or can we truly say it's for His? You know, we see this example in in Acts chapter 8 when... uh, um, Simon the magician, he, he goes to Peter and he's like, hey, how much is the Holy Spirit? I'd love to have that power. Right? And you remember what Simon Peter says? He goes, oh my goodness, you're, you're a bonehead. Uh, that's the Eric Standard Version translation. But uh, he, he says, uh, may your silver and gold perish with you because you ask for something that is not yours. So again, the motives were wrong there. See, the Holy Spirit is given for God's work. The Apostle Paul knows this. He, he said, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And the context he's talking about there is for the good of God's gospel and, and, his, and his work. You see, the Spirit's presence and activity in us has nothing to do with our natural abilities We've not received them because we've earned or somehow deserved them. And and, and since these gifts come according to God's will and not ours, it ought to be clear that they should not be used for our own boasting or for our own entertainment. I mean, God calls us to pursue Him, not what He might do for us. I mean, listen, I would love to see more miracles. And by the way, we have seen some of those in in recent days. I mean, we've seen healing. You may be going, does that really happen? It happens. Like, we've seen some incredible things take place. I mean, I would love to see more and more of those. Uh, But but if, if we're putting our focus on more miracles and put our energy in pursuit in that, we guaranteed will ignore the priorities 
of God for us. And that's what, you know, the Holy Spirit, He calls us back to what we were created for. For God's glory and His mission. Four things is this. The Holy Spirit works to glorify God. The Holy Spirit works to glorify God. John 16, 14, He, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me, talking about Jesus, for He will take what is mine and declare it to you. So, listen, when we're talking about uh, spiritual gifts, I, I need you to understand that the primary spiritual gift is the Holy Spirit Himself. Okay? That's the primary gift. It is absolutely true that the Holy Spirit gives unique gifts to the body of Christ for the exhortation and the building up of the church. It is absolutely true. Sometimes He may give you some of those gifts for a lifetime, sometimes He may bestow some of those gifts for a period of time, but but the primary gift is the Holy Spirit. And so those gifts are not to magnify any one person other than Christ. Other than Christ. In fact, we see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. The Corinthian church, they were bad about this. You know, they were, they were I mean, they were notorious for trying to use the Spirit to magnify itself. And there is one point where the church became chaotic because individuals were, were not concerned with the betterment of the church, but they were trying to use the manifestations of the Spirit for their own glory. They weren't interested in what God was doing in others. They just wanted to show off what God was doing in them. And so as they, they fought all for attention, it resulted in this mass confusion where everybody tried to speak at the same time. But again, note, God gives us his spirit so that we will become more like Jesus in order to magnify his name and his renown. That's what Jesus said in John 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Fifth thing is this. The Holy Spirit's hand of conviction is also his hand of care. The Holy Spirit's hand of conviction is also his hand of care. We don't always like this or get this. So here's what John 16, 8 and 11 says. When he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So, Jesus has to convict sin. He has to deal with sin. Uh, God is a holy, just God, and therefore uh, sin has to be dealt with. Jesus does that for us on our behalf. Amen? But he also is there to make sure righteousness is put in us, that hand of care. So it's conviction and care. Note that the Holy Spirit is the principal actor who works for our growth. We, we want to be conformed in the image of Christ. And so the Holy Spirit, He's going to argue with you. He's going to exhort you. He's going to plead with you to live lives that honor God and understand the realities of His love for us. It is the job of the Holy Spirit. It is the job of the advocate to argue with you in the court of your heart to make the case for you that you are in Christ to show you how rich you are as a child of God. And it's our job to listen to the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, I think as, as we think about that, we may kind of bristle at the idea. I mean, who wants somebody, you know, telling them and challenging them something all the time? But maybe we just need to flip our thinking. I mean, who wouldn't want the God of the universe to speak into every decision? that we would have. And I would even say, consider this. I mean, what an amazing thought, as I was talking about earlier, how the Holy Spirit has been localized in us. I think there's this idea that, man, we would know God, we would know Jesus better had we been there 2,000 years ago and got to meet him. Hey, I'm Eric. Hey, I'm Jesus. Um, you know, walk with him, see his miracles, and for a, a period of time. And that, I just don't believe that to be true at all. 
In fact, what we see when Jesus hits the scene is he raises the bar on everything. He raises the bar on sacrifice. He raises the bar on generosity. And he raises the bar on his own power in his people. And so it is only the natural progression that after he has spent time here, for Jesus then to say, you know what, I may be going, but I'm going to leave a part of me in you as a child of God. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. And I think, you know, he does that again because this is Jesus saying, uh, like what we see in John 14, I'm, I'm, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to care for you in the way that I have cared for you. It's essentially what he says in verse 26 of chapter 14. The counselor will teach you all the things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. He even goes on in in verse 27. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. And man, what great news for you and me is that. That now the Holy Spirit, the God of the universe, lives in us and we can experience his peace as a constant peace, not a circumstantial one. You know, our peace isn't dictated by the number of likes that we get on Facebook or the money coming in or our job or whether we're in a beautiful setting or the stock market or, or maybe we're just around somebody who agitates us. But, but the Holy Spirit's peace is a constant that we can experience. Six is this, is the Holy Spirit empowers and enables the church. It empowers and enables the church. So, so in the New Testament... When, when the New Testament is talking about the church, it is almost 99% of the time talking about the local church, not the global church. There's actually just a few times in all of the New Testament that it's talking about the global church. It's talking about the local body. So, so why is this important? Why, why would I, uh, you know, why is that important for us? It's because our gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us or to be exercised and connected in the context of the local body. That's not to say that it's not going to have impact on the global. But the intent, what we see, the example in Scripture, is that it happens as connected to the local church. So whether those gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us as gifts of service or evangelism or, or generosity or healing, the vehicle in which they are to be expressed to start in the local church. Like Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 12. So with yourself, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Listen, what what the Bible teaches is that the local church is the seedbed for all ministry. Listen, there are some great parachurch ministries, but they don't exist. They don't thrive apart from the local church. God designed us to serve together because there's greater impact. And he has chosen for us to express those gifts that the Spirit gives us through a local expression that has a global impact. Seven, the Holy Spirit anoints believers for the service of the gospel. Anoints believers. So, boy, there's like a a whole six-sermon message that we could talk about. Some abuses with anointing and other things like that, but you need to know that anointing is a biblical word. I mean, anointing happens we see this no you don't have to look any further than acts chapter 2 when the holy spirit falls as we talked about in pentecost and he enabled the people there to speak languages that wouldn't otherwise be uh, uh, that, that were other than uh, hebrew or greek so that the gospel could go out and I mean, it is true that there are times that the Spirit falls in specific and unique ways for the glory of God. Historically, we have seen this in revivals and healings and other things. Last thing is this. The Holy Spirit eliminates truth. The Holy Spirit eliminates truth. And um, I, 
I love this passage because what it has meant to me in years. But John 16, 12 through 14. I have much more to say to you. This is, this is Jesus. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. So again, the Spirit illuminates truth. Listen to how Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. But as is written, what no eye has seen nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything everything even the depths of God so I love this I mean when Paul uses this word search I mean we usually think of uh, 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 of him referring to the act of trying to find something that that you know we would want to locate or discover that he's on some type of quest of knowledge or a search for knowledge trying to learn something that he doesn't presently know and that is exactly what it means and here's what he says is that the spirit searches the depths of God for us he acts as that searchlight, as that floodlight, and brings light to our understanding. So what do you need to know this morning? What's the takeaway? I haven't even done takeaways yet. Just one. Just one takeaway this morning. Is that the Holy Spirit speaks to you and for you. That the Holy Spirit speaks to you and for you. That He is your primary advocate that God lives in you. So what does that look like for you tomorrow? As you take this into your workplace, as you take this into your cubicle, as you take this into your home, as you take this into your relationships, as you take this into your pain, as you take this into the hospital, like what does this look like? How will you interface with the third person of the Trinity, God, who has been localized in you? As you're driving to work tomorrow, what's the conversation and who's it to? How are you going to allow the Holy Spirit to direct you? As you pray for your friend, man, I got so many friends right now with cancer. As you pray for your friend, how do you allow the Holy Spirit to speak into that? As you were faced at the office with an opportunity, I mean, if you just took this little shortcut, there, nobody would probably see it. I mean, you don't think somebody would see it. I mean, you would know about it, right? But, but there's a shortcut. If you took this, this could help you escalate on that ladder of corporate success, right? Are you inviting the Holy Spirit into that conversation? As you lay your head on the bed tonight, and you ask him for protection in perhaps your most vulnerable time, would you ask the Holy Spirit to speak into you? I just want to leave you with this kind of picture. Again, I want you to think about the Holy Spirit as kind of this attorney in the court of your heart, but also in the court of heaven, in a sense. You know, and if you have an attorney, if you have a, a, a lawyer, you have that advocate, then you're tied to that attorney. If he's your defense attorney, I mean, you are tied to Your life hangs in the balance of whether this attorney knows what he's talking about, can speak to the judge on your behalf, and to guide you and give you great counsel, right? And so, so what does that look like? I mean, so you and your attorney are there in court, and you're just stammering along. But, man, your attorney sounds eloquent. What does the judge hear? Eloquence. Maybe you're ignorant, but your, your, your attorney is brilliant. So what does it look like in court? Brilliance. I mean, in some cases, you may not even be asked to, to speak or come to court, but your attorney, your advocate comes on behalf of you. He appears in your place as your substitute. So what do you look like in court? Well, you look like whatever your advocate looks like. 
So if your advocate wins, you win. If your advocate loses, you lose. I mean, in short, you put your trust in the advocate for your very being. And here's what Jesus has said about that. He gives us the ultimate advocate. The Holy Spirit is not just some tool. He's a person. He's deity who defends us and counsels us and speaks for us and, and, and speaks to us. So how will you allow him to shape you? And as we continue to bounce who the Holy Spirit is off how the church and how we personally interact with one another, will we apply what Scripture says about who he is 